We're in the book of Acts, if you got your Bible. We are studying, I, I, just, I just think it's good to study. I, I like teaching books. It just, it's just fun to do. I, I, to, for, uh, for me it is. Um, I hope you've been enjoying it, but there's something for, for everybody. Amen? Acts is, Acts is the history book of the church. Um, you know, Luke wrote it, and Luke wrote Luke, and then, and then written right into a sequel, which is called Acts. And so it's the, it's the history book of the, and it should inspire us. It should inspire you. It should inspire me. This is the church that we shoot for. We can, as a church, we should look like this. I believe this with everything in me. I think that the church, the power needs to come back into the church. It'll save our children. A powerless church, a church that just has church in the mind doesn't save your children. It won't change them. It's got to work its way to the heart. It's got to be full of the Holy Spirit that's moving. It's the power. And so I, I, I just, I just, that's what I see when I see the book of Acts. It excites me because I want to be a church like that. Amen. I want to see people get healed. I want to see people get delivered. I want to see people get saved. By they, they just got saved by the thousands. I mean, it just came to Jesus. And so when we were, when I was looking at this, when you start something, because this is the start of the church. Acts is the start of the church. And every time you start something, you've got a first. There's always a first. I can remember when we started this church, we had our first service in the barn and what that looked like. And, and so, but even as us, as, as, as individuals, there's first. As babies, there's first steps, right? There's a first word or a first sentence. And, and there's a principle you find in the Word of God over and over again. It's grow or die, there's no staying dormant in the Word of God. I can't find it anywhere. There's no standing still. You're either growing in the Lord or you're decreasing. That's just the way it works. And so as we grow, we have firsts. We should never stop having firsts. I, I think it's a, I, I think maybe, maybe the first time you ever pray for somebody that asks for prayer. I don't, you know, I hope everybody in here has prayed for somebody, but if you haven't, just make it a first sometime. Go out and pray for somebody. Make it a first in your life. You know, so many times in my, in my life I see, I can take you back so many different places in my life where there were firsts. You know? First time I did this in ministry and the first time I preached, first time I preached, I, was, I preached in jail. I wasn't in jail, incarcerated, but I, was, I preached to some prisoners. I can remember uh, it was 11 guys giving the heart to the Lord that night. I remember that. And, and, and it, was, it was neat. I, I preached on redeeming the time. Could you imagine that? And be preaching that in jail, redeeming the time. But that's the word God gave me. So there's first. And every one of us here tonight, you should be aspiring to have a new first with God. You should be aspiring to have that. You never run out of first. God has more levels and more for everyone in here. He's got more of the Holy Spirit to pour into your vessel to where you'll go out and do greater works. Jesus said that greater works than these that you will do. Maybe you've never led somebody to the Lord. I pray that this year it will be a first for you to lead somebody to the Lord. Maybe your family, maybe your friends, whoever it is. But that's what I see when I see the book of Acts. I see a whole bunch of firsts. For the church. Remember the first day of Pentecost? 3,000 were added to the church and the Holy Spirit fell. They all spoke in tongues for the first time. It was an amazing thing that happened. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time. He had came and he had, he had moved on people before. He had, you know, people prophesied, you know, under the power of the Holy Spirit. But this was the first time he came down and filled people and the believers were filled and he stayed with them. Isn't that great? And then, and then here's the, the first time, right after the first day of Pentecost, there was a breakout. This was a first, a first of huge generosity. Remember that? They thought that everything they owned was every, they wanted to help everybody. They went and sold stuff and gave it to the, to the apostles so that they could help everybody. 
love and generosity only through the power of the Holy Spirit. I think it was the greatest evidence that someone was filled with the Holy Spirit is when he changes your whole character of who you are. You quit being selfish and you start thinking of others. You start loving others. That was the first. Then there was the first uh, public healing. Remember that? Peter and James, or John, Peter and John were walking to the temple, just a normal day, saw a lame guy, had been lame for 40 years. They reached down. They didn't have any change in their pocket. If they had spare change, they probably would have given it to him, but they didn't have any. They said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That was the first. Amen? See, that's what I'm talking about. You can have first in your life with the, when you walk with the Lord. I believe that. And that, that first public healing, it drew a crowd again, remember? It drew a crowd, and, and Peter said, oh, I see a chance for a first revival. And it opened up the first chance for a revival. Thousands were saved again right after that. That's a first, first revival. Then here came the first persecution of the church. They threw them in jail. They'd never been in jail before. They threw them in jail. But this, was, this, was, this time was different because it was the first time that they were going to hold their own when they stood before the high council. They didn't cower. They didn't run. They didn't deny Jesus. They stood up boldly because they were full of the Holy Ghost. And they, 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 they stood face to face and held off the Holy Spirit through them. That was the first persecution. Then there was a, a prayer meeting. This is, this is, what I, this is the, the first prayer post-prayer, post-Pentecost prayer meeting that I can see in the Bible. Remember that? They came back, told them what happened. Whole place was shaken, and it says they were all filled again with the Holy Spirit. So that first, that first prayer meeting started something else. It was the second miracle that happened. The place was shook. It was the second time they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The second time, immediately after the place was shook and they, they were all filled again, guess what happened? Great generosity broke out again, remember? It was crazy. And that brings us up to date where we're at right now on chapter 5. Last week I ended, or the last time we studied, I ended up on a rough note. And I, I made note, note to self on it, I'll never do that again. Jen looked at me and she said, I can't believe you moved on. And I, I, I believe it too on my spirit. I said the same thing. I said, I can't believe after I said it. But we, we went, went to Ananias and Safari. Remember that? Great generosity broke out in the church. And then there was this couple that got together. And they thought, well, we sold some land. It wasn't a sin to sell land. They could have kept all the money. But they lied to the Holy Spirit and they lied to God. And, and, and boy... They were, they were struck down dead. Guess what first time this was? This was the first time that God subtracted from the church. Think about that. Up until now, it, the Bible says that he had been adding daily to the church. Their numbers were being added daily to the church. But this is the first time God subtracted. I'm not, I'm not their judge. I don't know if they went to hell or not. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying at that time they were subtracted. This is the first time that God brought judgment into the house of God. This is also the third miracle that's recorded in Acts. <laughs> I bet you we never prayed for a miracle like that, have we? You ever think about that? We always think of miracles as being just like, wonderful things but that's a miracle when 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 someone comes in and they've lied to the holy spirit and boom dead wow could you imagine i i think it i it, it's there for a reason it's written for a reason it's for us it's to warn us it, we must never forget that god is a just god he's a loving god he's a good god he cares for us but he's also a just god i didn't write it if you don't like it, you take it up with him when you see it, when you see him. Amen? He's a just God. Never let us forget that we reap what we sow. It's right there. And let us never forget that we must be honest with him. God hates it when we lie, and especially to him. Amen? There are some great, great warnings to the church that I see here through this little story that, and I'm getting to, to our, where we're starting tonight, but 
Many people, I, I looked at it when I, was, when I was thinking about this, many people have lost God's divine plan for their life and God's direction over the love of money. Think about it. All through the Word of God, Achan, he hid stuff under his tent. Remember that? He almost cost all of Israel. He hid stuff under his tent. There was the rich young ruler that went away from Jesus sad. Remember that? He just went away sorrowfully. How about Judas? Judas, it was over money as well. And it's and it, here, this is the first judgment that came into the church, and it was over the love of money. It truly was. And here's another thing I saw, that whenever God is doing a great work, when you see him doing a great work somewhere, that the devil will plant counterfeits. Do you see that? These people were generous, and they were loving God, and they were bringing stuff to the Lord. And then here comes the devil, and he plants a couple counterfeits. So we got to be careful of that. Because I know we've got great things going on here. I know God's really been using. The Holy Spirit's been moving. We've seen people, things happen. So don't ever, don't ever throw out an original because of a counterfeit. There is a, there is a, a true moving of the Holy Spirit. There is a, God is a supernatural God, and he wants us to walk in supernatural ways. He just does. But you can't throw out the, the original because of a counterfeit that you've experienced. Amen? That's good. Okay, so that brings us up to chapter 5, verse 12. This is where we left off. It says this. It says, The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all of the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. But no one else dared to join them, even though all the people had a high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord. Crowds of men and women. And as a result of the apostles' work, sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats, so Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and, and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? This is the, Acts, this is the, this is the first church. This is, this is pow, the power. This is what God wants us to really walk in. I believe that. What I want you to see is God never wastes anything. He never wastes anything. Even that, that, that they fell down dead and, and people were scared, God didn't waste that. Did you see it? Great fear of the Lord came into the church. And what that did is it catapulted the gospel. It did. News spread everywhere. Can you believe what happened in that church? Can you believe it? Think about it. And, and I know that sounds crazy, I, you know, I, but it did. And then it separated the believers from the casual Christians. You, you see what I'm saying? You just weren't going to casually enter into Christianity after you heard about the two people that fell dead because they lied to God. It separated. God never wastes anything. Even if we see like, the, oh man, that's a terrible thing that happened. Even in an act of judgment, God never wasted. It It caused unbelievers to have a, a high regard for the church. Some of them didn't. It, it's, it sounds like it, it's almost contradicting itself because it says some didn't, wouldn't join, but then many were added every day. It sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. What it meant is, is some of them had a, the unbelievers had a high regard for the church. I wish the church would get back to the state where unbelievers, they still have a high regard for the church. But the problem is that we have too many casual Christians. Do you see what I'm saying? There's no difference. We've got to live a different life. And, and I'm not saying we're, we're holier than now. We're not. But when you live your life for the Lord and you've, and you've surrendered your life for the Lord, there should be a difference in your life. And unbelievers will have a higher regard for the church. It caused people to believe in the Lord Jesus by, I don't know how many were added, but I'm sure it was many. 
And it caused people to have faith for healing. This act of judgment actually caused people to have faith for healing. They wouldn't come to the church because they were scared, but they would literally lay their, their sick out in the street. Could you imagine that? You don't usually put your sick out in the street, but they put their sick out on the street on a bed, hoping that Peter's shadow would, cro- would cross over and they'd get healed. So many times, now watch this, so many times we want to put a man on a pedestal, don't we? You ever been there? I've been there. I've heard stories of great ministers. I've watched great ministers. So many times we want to put them on a high pedestal, but you can't do that. Even Peter. Peter, Peter, if he was here today, he'd tell you there's nothing good in me but Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He would. What it was is, I really believe this. I believe that they, they moved in faith. When you put your sick out in the street, that's an act of faith. That's a movement of faith. So many times... You and I need to act on our faith. I believe that. Just like I preached Sunday, that man that laid on the mat, he had a choice. He could have laid there and said, okay, I've been touched by Jesus, let's go. Or he jumped up. And that's what happened here. I believe that the people, by the act of faith, they put their, their, they put their, their sick out there and they were healed. Amen? Amen? It's just like the woman that pressed her way through the crowd to get to Jesus. So many times Jesus said this. I, wish, I hope we all get this tonight. So many times Jesus said to people, Be it unto you according to your faith. Didn't he say that? He said, Be it unto you according to your faith. I pray that our faith increases, that, that our unbelief is, is suppressed. Amen? I've heard it explained this way sometimes, that we all have the same measure of faith. God didn't have a big dipper or a little dipper when he was handing out faith. You still, you, everybody's got the same measure of faith. But what you do have is not everybody has the same level of belief. Because everything you bring into your life, the news, all the stuff that you watch, all the things that you put into your heart and your mind... That causes your unbelief to grow. And then your unbelief is so, so great that it can't enact your faith. But if you start getting into the Word and you start getting around people that have faith and that, that will build your faith and that will talk about the Lord and the good things and the things that He's doing and not the bad things, but just start concentrating on the goodness of God. Talk about heaven. Talk about what we have to earn in heaven and the things that we have to gain. You start building your un- belief in who Jesus is and then your faith can work. I really believe that with everything in me. But I think so many of us have this huge bush of unbelief in our life because of all the things we take into it. First place we need to go is to Jesus. I'm not against doctors. I'm not. I'm not against getting help. But the first place we need to go is Jesus. Then go to a doctor if you need to. Amen? But don't go, don't go looking everywhere. Go to Jesus first. Okay. All right, verse 17. The high priest and his officials, who were Sadducees, were filled with jealousy, and they arrested the apostles and put them in a public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, and brought them out. And he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message, of the message of life. You know what this was? This was the first supernatural jailbreak. Yeah? Isn't that awesome? The first supernatural jailbreak. So daybreak, the apostles entered the temple, and as they were told, as they were told, and immediately began teaching. And when the high priest and his officials arrived, arrived, they convened the high council, the full assembly of elders of Israel, and then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. But when the guards went to the jail, the men were gone. So they returned to the council and reported, The jail was securely locked with the guards standing outside, but when we opened the gates, there was no one there. And when the captain of the temple guard and the leading priest heard this, they were perplexed, wondering 
where it would all end. Then someone arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing at the temple teaching the people. And the captain went to his temple guards and arrested went to his temple guards and arrested the apostles, but without violence, for they were afraid of the people that would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council, and the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name. He said, Instead, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. That's, that's quite a scene right there, isn't it? I tell you this, the name of Jesus stirs up everything. Can you see that? They, weren't, they, weren't, they, they wouldn't have been mad if, they, if they'd have been teaching some other religion or teaching some other, some other things that were just off the wall. But when they started teaching in the name of Jesus... And that's the way it is. I'm telling you, if we'll just learn to understand, you understand, you lift up Jesus, he does all the work. He does. I've learned when I'm praying for people anymore, I start lifting up Jesus. He's, he's the one we have to lift up. If we get off of anything else, we, we might as well close the church's doors. We've got to lift up Jesus. They said, don't preach in this man's name. That's something, isn't it? And then uh, and the King James says on that last verse, it says, uh, hit, you're trying to make us responsible and put his blood on us. That's what the King James says, to put his blood on us. These are the same people that cried out to Pilate. Think about this. This is the same people that told Pilate when, when he said, his blood's not on my hands. What did they say? Let his blood be on us and our children. Right now, they're just switched around, and they're denying it. It's funny how that works, isn't it? That's crazy, isn't it? It's awesome to see that God, God's still in control, and he still, he still loves them. And even through all this, you know, if they would just humble themselves and seek God, he would forgive them. That's the God I serve. And Peter, once again, verse 29, it says, But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. And then God put him in a place of honor at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit who is given by God to those who obey him. And when they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. But one member of, the, of a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people, stood up and ordered that men be sent outside the, the council chambers for a while. Then he said to his colleagues, Men of Israel, take care of what you're planning to do to these men. Some time ago, there was a, a fellow named Thaddeus who pretended to be someone great, and about 400 joined him. But when he was killed and all his followers went their various ways, the whole movement came to nothing. After him, at that time of the census, there was a Judas of Galilee. He got the people to follow him, but he was killed too, and all his followers scattered. So my advice is to leave these men alone. Let them go. If they're planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it's from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting God himself. Others accepted his advice. They called in the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them never to speak again in the name of Jesus, and they let him go. That's the first time we had physical abuse of, of laying on of hands is right there in, for the gospel. They were flogged and they were beat up. I'll finish this chapter real quick. It says, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace at the name of Jesus. 
And every day in the temple, from house to house, they continue to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. I'm so, it's so good, isn't it? That's the message right there. If we ever get away from that, you know, I, I was tell, talking to Vince today. We were talking in my office, and, and I said, I, I love preaching about the Holy Spirit. I love preaching about healing. I love preaching all the, all the different the histories and stories of the Bible. But, but, I, but whenever I feel like I'm getting a little dry in my messages, I go back to Jesus, and I preach as much as I can about him. And you can feel that it's the power of the gospel is Jesus. And, and, and that's what they keep telling them over and over again. They try to suppress, suppress who Jesus is. They try to put him away, but they can't do it. And that's why the Holy Spirit was given to us, to be a witness to who he is. Amen? It's so good. And, and I'll tell you this, a lot of times, have you ever seen a ministry and you're like, mm, I don't know about that. You ever done that? Come on, you have. You had to, right? Everybody's watched some television ministries, right? And you're like, hmm, that's some crazy stuff right there. This is funny. The, the Lord uses even people that are, that are, you know, Gamaliel, I don't know if he was uh, a Christian. I kind of doubt it. But he use, even uses sinners to speak to you. Whenever I see something like that, and I'm not sure of it, the words of his words, because it's in the Bible, it still rings in my head. I let it go. I let that ministry go. I pray. I say, Lord, if it's of you, wonderful. If it's not, you shut it down. And I think in my mind, if it's not of God, it'll come to nothing. Sometimes we got to quit worrying about, is it of God? Is it not of God? Is it of God? Is it not of God? Because you know what? There's some ministers that love God that sometimes they don't think the way I think. And I just pray for them. I say, God, don't let them mislead people. But at the same time, if it's not of you, you can close it up. And so I don't worry about it. I don't, I don't fret over it. I say, if it's of you, it'll last. If it won't, it'll fall to pieces. And that's the way it works. I really believe that. Because a social club will only be a social club so long. But if it's a real movement of God, it'll stay. It'll last. If it's founded on Jesus... That's good. If it's of God. They preach Jesus. If you, and I said this the other week. I said, if you want long longevity in your ministry, you, pe- you preach Jesus. You think about it. It's 2022. 2,000 years ago, they preached this message and we're talking about it. He was right. If it's, found on, if it's, if it's God's for it, it's going to last. And, you know, if they were here, every one of these disciples, if they were here today and they could stand up here on the pulpit and they preach to you, they would preach the same thing. Be obedient. Repent. Give it to God. Be baptized. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what Peter told them when, when they asked me, what must we do? They didn't hold any special meetings for anything, but they just preached Jesus. Amen. It's good, isn't it? Sometimes we got to take our eyes off uh, other things, other ministries, and just, just preach Jesus. Don't worry about it. Let, let, let God deal with it. We're not called to be weed patrol. We let God take care of it, right? Amen. So good. If you would, just bow your heads with me a minute tonight. If there's anybody here, I always give opportunity. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's the same message. If Peter, if he was standing up here, he would, he would say the same thing. Repent for the forgive, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be baptized. It's, and be baptized is the first, the first step of obedience. And so if you, if you need to be baptized, that's something we need to talk about. Amen. You felt that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Amen. So, it, 
Is there anybody that say, I, I want to I wanna give my heart to Jesus tonight? And here's the second thing. Is there anybody here that says, I just, want, I just need to make sure that I lift up Jesus more in every area of my life? If that's you, just raise your hand. I won't pray with you. I won't agree with you in prayer. The Bible says we're two or three agree. Hands everywhere. Amen. I'm going to pray for that. We're going, to, we're going to agree in prayer that God will give us opportunities to lift up the name of Jesus. Not just God, but the name of Jesus. Okay? Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. We thank you and praise you. Lord, I, I, I'm so thankful we can come right before your throne. Your word says that we can come boldly before the throne because of what your son Jesus did. Him tearing, tearing the veil from the top to the bottom, we have access. Lord, you've seen every hand that went up here and says, we want to speak the name of Jesus boldly. We want, we want to be able to reach our friends, our family, our coworkers, those that are becoming contact in every way. Lord, I pray that right now. I pray that you would make opportunities for us to be able to speak the name of Jesus, especially over this, this holiday, this Christmas season, Lord, when people are hurting and looking for you. I pray that right now. God, I pray that you would strengthen our hearts. Let us preach the, the gospel with boldness. That's what the apostles prayed for, and that's what I pray for each and every one of us. Let us be bold for you. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. Amen.